Okay, so while Lisa sets up, um, I just wanted to do a, um, an intro of why her topic is so crucial for our uh, phase two uh, portion. As you know, we will be linking with um, insurance data and we will be linking with other sorts of data. And unless we have a uh, an identifier, a way to know this patient is the same patient across two data sets, then we cannot do this. Also, for example, the VA in San Diego and UCSD have a, a, a large overlap of patients. And so far, we've been counting everything separately. But as we move along, the analysis will have to take into account that this is the same patient across the two systems, even though we'll still not move data around, at, at least we'll know about them. So I think Lisa is all yeah, set. I'm just gonna take the mouse. Okay. So, the, uh, and I will make a, a little marketing here too. For this kind of distributed data in which you have part of the patient's data in one place, let's say the health system, and part of the other data from the same patient in another system like a health insurance company. Xiao uh, Chen, Shuang, and others here have developed a, an algorithm that you can do distributed data analysis on the two databases uh, without bringing the data together. So you can do a logistic regression. You, you can do propensity uh, score uh, across the, the two data sets without bringing the data together. So this uh, article is coming soon in the best informatics journal there is. <laughs> <laughs> so watch out for it, because I think it's a very important contribution. Uh, the previous one was hor horizontal data, that is every place has the, the same kind of data. And now we're going to this vertical partition, uh, which uh, also Jaideep is uh, the expert here. So it will be very exciting to come. So with that, I hope I, I got you, Thank you. going. So, yeah. so Lisa will talk about uh, yeah, identity management. Yeah. So hi everyone, yeah, I'm Lisa Schilling. I'm at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and I'm really excited to be here today. I'm really excited to be joining the P-Scanner team and get to meet all of you and really begin to collaborate with all of you and see how I can uh, help with all the work that you do. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, I did want to just talk about some of the, a little bit about the work that we've been doing today and also even though they're not here, introduce you to some of the other people that are gonna be coming from the University of Colorado. So just a little mini background on what um, kind of we've been doing as a team. We actually were funded for a project called SafetyNet, which was one of ARC's funded distributed research networks. We were funded at the t same time that Scanner was funded back in 2010, this time of the year. And we worked on a project to create a distributed research network among safety net practices. And so right now we have practices um, and networks in Colorado, in Tennessee, in Vermont, and a partner in California also. So in, in doing that work though, we really started working with the P-Scanner group at that time when we had both selected the OMOP common data model and we both were kind of requesting some changes to that model. My team was focused on making the model more appropriate for comparative effectiveness research and Lucilla and Daniela's team were really looking at it from a health economist standpoint. So what are the other you know, fields and attributes that the, that the model needed to support that type of work? So we've actually had a fairly long-term collaboration over the years and um, that's been continuing. The other work that um, we did with SafetyNet, we were very, um, I think, lucky in some sense to actually manage getting claims data for our partners. And we had to work with our partners to do that. So we did that in Colorado, getting data from the all payer claims database. And we focused on Medicaid data. The all payers claims database was just coming up in Colorado at that point. And then in Vermont with the Department of Vermont Health Affairs, which was an entity that managed um, billing and healthcare for um, mainly for Medicaid. So, um, so that was a big accomplishment on our part. So just to 
and then a little bit of the work that I've been doing in the meantime that kind of overlaps with the P scanner work is continuing to work on the OMOP and PCORNET data transformations. And I've been part of a team that includes P scan members, um, the New York CDRN, and then PEDSNET members to actually work on that OMOP PCORNET transformation. So that's been a great way for me to learn a little bit more too about what some of you know the P scanner partners are doing. So in addition to myself, though, other members of the team that will be working um, with me include Patrick Hosakawa. He's a computer scientist with a master's in biostatistics, biostatistics. And he's been a great member of our team. He's done a lot of our um, data modeling, helped with our ETL work and our data quality work. So um, really, you know, great person. And I'm really proud of this whole team and glad that they'll be continuing to work with the P-Scanner group. Um, Michael Kahn, who many of you know, who, he's been very involved in PEDSnet and in the portal where he's been for both those projects the informatics lead and has a role in PCORI kind of advising the clinical data research networks on informatics. He'll be a consultant also in this project. Bethany Kwan is a young investigator who started with our project as a project director for the Safety Net project and is very interested in the applications of behavioral theory to healthcare interventions and has also played a significant role for us um, in the selection and the implementation of patient reported outcomes that we did a demonstration project on. Todong is another junior faculty member, a computer scientist who's been working with us for over um, three years and has a real interest both in data modeling but also um, identity management. So. Could you please use the microphone? Oh, sure. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I thought I was going all one direction here, but maybe not. Okay, so um, so a little bit just about some of the work that we've done for data quality, and I don't want to get too much into the background here, but you know we're looking at is the data complete, is it missing, um, making sure that data is non-duplicative. We want to make sure that we have correct and valid data, and that we have comprehensive data. So just that's kind of a little bit of a mini background on where we started with this. And what I'm showing you now, this is some of the work that we did for with our safety net practices. And one thing just to point out, um, we had we developed a software system that's open source and available that we call Rosita that helped our practices with some of the data transformation. And we had within our system data was first loaded into raw tables and then it went to a standard what we call the standard table which was kind of you could think of as a pre OMOP and then to OMOP and we had reports that were built within this system using a Jasper um, reporting services tool that our partners could run so we could assess kind of the quality of their data and the transformation steps. So some of this at the bottom you can't see and that's okay. I just wanted to highlight the red area. So here you could see we had a partner with over 10 million observations, but when we got to the OMOP table we were down to 2 million. So obviously something was wrong here. And for us, just what happens between this standard and OMOP data transformation is there's a deduplication step that happens. There's concept ID mapping that happens. So that's mapping these source um, codes to an OMOP standard concept ID. So you know when we saw that something was wrong here, we knew that we were losing data and we needed to know why. And so what was going on here is the partner actually had a truncated their source identifiers. And so in our deduplication process, it was seeing the source identifier as being the same because it had been truncated and it was deduplicating all those records. So this was something that was pretty easy to correct, but we definitely needed to kind of be able to track how the data was moving throughout the system. Just another thing I thought I would point out, the Oscar results here where there's 13, over 13 million results. Um, OMOP initially had a process, um, they had Oscar kind of tools that were data characterization and data quality tools and we built those into our system so that we could compute those automatically and then be able to report on them. So you can see it's not something that was loaded into the raw tables and it isn't something that was in our standard but it was something that was computed between standard and OMOP. 
this is just another visual. And here we see, you know, the red arrow all of a sudden you green, the green line kind of skyrockets up. And those are observations and those are lab results where now this system was getting um, feeds from a laboratory. So now automatically into their electronic records, they were getting lab results and therefore we were getting them into the OMOP database. And so some of this is the type of, you know, kind of metadata, meta information that we want to have about our systems. You know, what happened? What was the result for this change? And then with everything beginning in January 2009, most of you would probably guess that this is a time that their electronic medical record, they switched from one to another, and a lot of condition start dates were given that date. So. Another one, I'm not sure there's anything that, um, that was necessarily wrong with this, but um, we, we did look at the number of um, refills. We wanted to get a sense, you know, do these numbers seem to be right? Is the gist of it right? So you can see there's, there's sections here. So one is on the number of refills, then the second column set is the quantity prescribed, and then the days supplied. We didn't actually get any information on days supplied from this partner. But we did get refills and we got quantity. And initially, when we did this, and I couldn't find um, this result, it was a little hard to find, but we had quantities that were in the um, 9,000 range. And there was a thought that we were doing something wrong. And um, one of our programmers kind of went into the report and said, well, it must be 90, so we'll just divide it by 100 and make it the right number. And it's like, well, that doesn't really like work. It doesn't work that way. And when we, when we went in and we investigated it further, we found that you know, many of these were, were volumes. So these were quantities that were being prescribed in volumes. So you know, 900 mLs of something and, and things like that. But um, so there's, you know, there's definitely a lot of diligence and attention that needs to be um, paid to this. So. And this is another thing that we did, just kind of you know looking at all the tables. So um, we went kind of table by table and had output like this. And this is just the observation table again. So we could see when we had null strings and when we had null values. And again, look at the look if there was any information loss along the way. So then the, what I wanted to show you, this is just a screenshot, but I actually wanted to show you this. So I don't know if the person up there can help me get, I think I can do this right from here. Let's see. How can I get the slides? Let's, okay, thanks. You should be able to ignore that and go, there you go. And there you go. Okay. Great. So, um, so this is the Odyssey, so the OMOP Health Information Data Science site, and this is their Achilles tool. And I did take some screenshots of this in case it wasn't going to work, but it looked like things were working today. So this is their data um, characterization and quality. And I think right now, let me just see, I'm just going to choose this synthetic data set. So. Um, so you can see the type of information. And we saw Daniela, I think, showed this one already, but I was going to go through a few of them. So you can see you know, the, uh, the gender of the population, the age that they had their first observation. You get an idea of the cumulative um, observations for the patients and then the continuous observations per month for the persons that are in your, um, in your data set. And let's see. So you could, there's reports on all of these, these features. I think, I don't know if we looked at person before, but now once again, you can see their year of birth, um, gender, race, ethnicity. So I think some very useful information to be able to learn more about your population and also to determine if this representation seems correct to you or not. So if you don't typically see you know, people who are over the age of 65, then you know you're gonna have some low um, numbers in here. And then the one thing that I think, and this is true, you know, we can see all of these things for many different um, tables here. And I'll look at data density. I think this is kind of a nice one. Um, so again, here we've got the number of records, and you can see by condition era, condition occurrence, drug, drug exposure, all the common OMOP tables, and then by year. 
and there's records per person, concepts per person, so again, to see whether we're having concept IDs. And when we ran this first on some of our data, I'll tell you, we had some um, gender distributions where the age was negative, so we knew right away that there was some things wrong with our data. We've set this up in kind of a test environment with one of our partner's data at this point. Achilles heel, which is the one I really wanted to show you. So this gives some very concrete error messages regarding um, the suspected or potential errors in the data. So here's, you know, um, so number of persons with at least one condition occurrence, by condition concept ID, two concepts in the data are not in the correct vocabulary. So there was some vocabulary mapping problem. Um, number of persons by race, data with unmapped concepts. So one of the things that we want when we're using the OMAP model, we want to get everything mapped to a concept. Um, I know there's another one in here, you know, there are some where you let's see distribution of time from death to last condition, maximum value should not be positive. So really doing quite a few, I think there's over like 1,400 data checks that are done automatically through this system and then, and then reported on. So this is, again, I think will be very useful to the P-Scanner um, partners and something that we can, you know, have a process for using and a process for improving the data and really learn from this work. So I'm going to get rid of that and go back to my slides. This is where I just can't see the mouse on, oh, here we go, okay. So I'm going to skip now. I'll take. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to. These were safety slides. So I'm going to skip past those. Oh, I didn't show this, but I think you saw that earlier. And I'm going to move on to the identity management. So this is an area where we've been doing quite a bit of work, and because we had uh, claims data and clinical data, we did need to link the patients um, on an identifier. What we did initially is we actually just selected, because we were dealing mainly with Medicaid data, we used the Medicaid ID, and we did a deterministic linkage based on that variable. But we knew that, you know, that worked fine, but we weren't always going to have that information and we needed to, you know, push the agenda further. So some of the work we did was looking at both, um, looking at other methods of probabilistic linkage and looking at methods of, um, or other methods of deterministic linkage, but then also probabilistic linkage too. So most of you probably know, but, you know, the idea for us was really to link a person across two or more data sets. And the reason to do this is both to improve the completeness or the comprehensiveness of your data, and also to get rid of redundant data or duplicate persons, so not have one person counted twice. And within these approaches, there are both centralized identity management approaches and more local identity management approaches. And, and then there's also the, um, the deterministic and probabilistic. So um, one of the things with the deterministic linkage, I guess, you know, it is, people can be very certain about the linkage. Um, and when using the, the quasi-identifiers, they either match or they don't match. So you either end up with a linkage or you don't have a linkage. But because of that, there's a lot of false negatives in linking individuals, and you actually lose a lot of potential information. Um, and the performance is very dependent on the setting that you're in. So we did begin to look at more probabilistic methods, which can be more robust. They actually have greater stability when you use them across different settings. Um, but they're computationally, they can be very heavy, and you have, to, you have to have a plan for how you're going to deal with the uncertain matches. So when you do a probabilistic linkage, you have a threshold, and if the match is above this probability threshold, so above this threshold of likelihood of being the same person, then it's a match. And many people say if it's below a certain threshold, then it's definitely not a match. But you end up with a lot of people in the center, and you need to know what to do with those folks. So it can be a bit more complex. 
We also wanted to look at, we were also looking at privacy protected methods. So methods where you're not sharing clear text identifiers, but you're using privacy protected methods. So in this case, a globally unique identifier would be assigned to the hash values that actually, you know, are similar enough that you're consi considering them to be a match for the probabilistic method. Um, so in the um, centralized system, what we have is you, and I just called for, for this talk, I called it a P-Scanner Data Coordinating Center. So in this, in this circumstance, the sites locally would get kind of a seed to create a hash code. So this would be kind of, you could think of it as the magic that helps create the hash codes out of the identified kind of quasi-identifiers that are gonna be used in the system. And with that seed, this hash code is determined that's sent to a central entity. From the central entity, a, a GUID is created. And that is, and actually the hash codes are sent from multiple entities and they're linked. And then a GUID is associated with those. And then back to each partner, you'd send the GUID and you'd send the hash code and then they would maintain that on their site. There are some PCORnet sites that are also, um, sending the whole data back. So it's not just central identity management, but it's data management too. In a distributed system, you still have a central entity that's matching those hashed IDs and assigning a GUID and sending that back to the partners. But at that point, um, the partners have the GUID. So partner A would have a GUID for patient A that matches partner B's GUID for that same person. So at that point, they don't really need the central entity to intervene anymore, but that central entity is managing kind of the way the hash code's created and is managing linkage of those hash codes in the assignment of the GUID. Um, so, you know, in both, in both approaches, there needs to be this central coordinating um, center to do this. And I'm going to move past this. So one of the ones that we had been looking at was the, the NDAR, the National Database for Autism Research. And I think this schematic mainly shows kind of what I've already talked about in this process. I want to get to this. So one of the pilots we did with the NDAR work was we took 3,000 known matches. Um, it was simulated data. We corrupted the data, similar to the way that electronic health record data would be corrupted, and used this system to, to do the matches. And we had no false positives, but we only had 882 um, true positives. So the match rate was really limited by missing data and can be limited by, um, by indiscriminate variables, so variables that don't really help you that much, such as sex. Then other work that we've done in this area, and this was with clear text quasi identifiers, is we tested six different methods. And some of you may be familiar with these methods to, um, for privacy protected rink linkage. So the frill is, um, is often used. And so we used six different methods of frill zero. So that's if something matches, if something is missing, it doesn't get any weight at all. Frill 100 is even if it's missing, it's assumed to be a perfect match on that variable. And then we created, and really Tonong did, did this work. This is really his work. Then he created these other methods of weight redistribution, where you redistribute the weight that would be given to um, a variable pair. Distance imputation, where instead of imputing a value, you're imputing the distance, which is a measure of similarity between the variable pair. And then what we called linkage expansion techniques, which was saying, you know, if within a set of records, we have too many missing variables to use them for linkage, then we're going to select another variable to add to the um, to the linkage mechanism. And we had very good results with this with almost a 90%, it was over 90% for a positive rate and a positive predictive rate. So it ended up this full linkage expansion was actually very accurate and seemed um, from a performance standpoint worked okay. So just ongoing work, and I think this is my last slide, um, we're 
Tone is now doing some work with the PEDSnet, and we're looking at uh, 400 patients matching up electronic health record data and Express Scripts data and using some of these techniques, which we're kind of just, I'm calling Frill Plus for today, so using these um, linkage expansion techniques. And that's really the only kind of probabilistic method that we've seen. Both the NDAR and Capricorn are deterministic, and so our goals with this are really to test performance, to test accuracy, and this is some of the work that we'll, we're hoping to kind of do on behalf of P-Scanner also. Oh. And that's, that's it for me. So. And I know I went over, so I don't know if you get any questions or not. had a quick two-parter. So one, um, do you get any pushback on IRBs and, uh, if they don't understand the one-way hashing and the security that are around that in terms of if you wrap PHI in a hashing function and send it outside, um, do they give that credit for, you know, for the identification? And then um, two, um, with the expansion linkage method, do you have to sort of have a bunch of additional variables that everybody is, is submitting, right, where, where it can choose the additional variables for the for linkage? Yeah, well, we use the... Um, yeah, so, so the first question was about IRB pushback, and I guess we haven't gotten any IRB pushback yet, but I don't know that we've actually tried to do a clinical research study using these identifiers. You know, to do the work that we've done, we haven't gotten any pushback, and I've kind of labeled it like it's there may be some personal health identifiers, but there's no health information with it. So it's more like phone book information that we use to do the testing of the linkage, you know? Um, and then the, the second question, yeah, for the expanded linkage mechanisms, we do, need to, we do need to have more data that we think is potentially a linkage variable. We need that to come with the data sets. And then those computations are all done before the data is even hashed to kind of, or, or the linkages are even done to say what potentially could be the best variables here to link on. And so that at work all, and that's what makes it a little computationally heavy. So. Thank you. Uh, and I'm sure you'll be available. I will. Yeah. Thank you. Again. Thank you.